When the G20 leaders first met uh, in November of 2008 at their first uh, summit in Washington, they said something like this, major underlying factors to the current situation, and the current situation was a major crisis, were among others, inconsistent and insufficiently coordinated macroeconomic policies, inadequate structural reforms, which led to unsustainable global economic outcomes. These developments together contributed to excesses and ultimately resulted in severe market disruption. Then they had a, a great summit in London in April of 2009, and they met for the third time in Pittsburgh in September of 2009. And at Pittsburgh, they announced a framework for a strong, sustainable, and balanced growth where they committed their governments to work together to ensure, and I want to underline this, that fiscal, monetary, trade, and structural policies are collectively consistent. They also committed to collectively undertake macroprudential and regulatory policies to help prevent credit and asset cycles from becoming forces of destabilization. Furthermore, they committed to have robust policy recommendations ready for an executable agreement by the November 2010 Korea summit. Well, if one wants to be benign and charitable, uh, given what I just read, it will be very hard to blame the G20 for a lack of a right uh, diagnosis and a an scarcity of good intentions. I think they had a good diagnosis, and they have very good intentions. However, in order to solve complex problems, much more than good intentions is needed. The fact is that as we gather here today, uh, on the one hand, we couldn't declare the old 809 crisis uh, over. It's not over. And given events during this summer and during the fall, it is not outlandish to believe that there is a significant probability that the world may be at risk of dipping again into a global crisis. And I think particularly after the events of today, this uh, holds uh, true. Of course, we are where we are because uh, domestic uh, policies uh, in each of the relevant uh, economies, uh, or I should say domestic political systems, have failed to implement and deliver the actions warranted by their own national interests. So there is a failure of domestic policies, but I think, uh, and I submit to you, that this failure also obeys to the fact that uh, the countries at the G20, particularly the key ones, haven't properly adopted and executed the kind of international coordination and cooperation that they committed to deliver at least during the first three summits. But in any case, we are uh, where we are. Uh, I must uh, say that uh, personally, I have always been uh, a supporter of the idea of a G20, uh, well before the G20 at the leaders level was uh, adopted in various docu documents, statements, and studies. Uh, I express uh, that that uh, was uh, necessary. So in no way my criticism is directed to the idea that we need uh, something like the G20, but uh, my skepticism really is addressed to the fact that the G20, which uh, of course has a problem of legitimacy in its origin, because it's a group of self-appointed uh, countries to uh, steer the global economy, uh, could have uh, legitimacy stemming 
from the delivery of uh, the actions needed to overcome the economic and financial crisis. And here we are three years after, and the delivery uh, is not there, and therefore the G20 can have uh, a double problem of legitimacy. Legitimacy of origin and legitimacy, legitimacy, failed legitimacy of execution. And this, I think, is a very bad news for the world because this is one more example in which uh, what some people cl call global economic governance, which is not the same as global economic government, is falling behind the process of global integration through which uh, we have gone particularly over the last decades, which uh, evidently has had a lot of uh, benefits for humanity at large, but we also knew that it also has significant downsides, and if you want to minimize those downsides, then you must be willing to adopt uh, a reasonable degree of global economic governance, because if you don't have that, then we can be in deep trouble, as present circumstances uh, clearly show. So that is the general framework, although the uh, specifics are much more uh, entertaining, and I would say depressing, <laughs> to say the least. And this is not really black humor. I think we are really at uh, a severe risk uh, to be in a very difficult, uh, almost uh, dramatic economic situation again. And this happens when uh, we must recognize that the political and economic uh, capital that governments have to confront crises of this magnitude has been diminished significantly because it has spent in the last three years, uh, confronting and dealing with a very difficult uh, situation. So it's almost ironic that this uh, new G20 uh, summit uh, that will be taking place in a couple of days in Cannes, France, uh, <coughs> takes place in conditions of uncertainty, of uh, almost uh, chaos, even more severe than conditions that prevailed at the time of the first summit in November of 2008. Because after all, by the time of the summit, at least uh, central banks had been reasonably coordinated. Uh, finance ministers have taken some steps. The US authorities were in the process of controlling the financial crisis to some degree in this country, and many actions had been taken. So in a way, leaders could get there to reason in a more uh, calm way vis-a-vis -vis the situation in September of 08, and today they don't have that privilege. They have had formal preparations towards this summit, and let me tell you something, in my opinion, whatever they prepare has to be put in the garbage. <laughs> because circumstances are so different relative to their preparation for this uh, summit. And I am not, I'm not sure what they are really going to talk about uh, and how they are going to face up uh, to come out and say, here we have guidance, solution, a, pr a, a plan, as we promised three years ago and two years ago that we will have, and finally we have it and the world can have some peace of mind in front of economic events. Unfortunately, I cannot predict that that uh, will happen, and probably we will have a rather difficult, if not um, uh, cumbersome outcome out of the G20. So to discuss those and other issues, uh, we have now really an, uh, a, a fantastic uh, panel uh, with uh, three outstanding individuals who have uh, dedicated uh, a lot of uh, study, uh, talent, to analyze issues like the ones that concern us uh, this afternoon. We have, of course, our very own uh, Steve Roach, 
uh, who after uh, a long uh, career uh, as a chief economist of a large financial institution uh, has come uh, to our university as a senior fellow at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. Some of his students are here, I know, and uh, most people know about how sharp uh, Steve has been uh, well before the crisis, warning people about what was cooking and uh, during the crisis, and he has had uh, enormous contributions for our understanding of the situation. Uh, we have uh, Ben Steele, who is uh, from the, he's director of international economics at the Council of Foreign Relations. But if you look at uh, his uh, books, uh, in addition to his present work and the things that he has uh, written about and his uh, uh, incredibly uh, powerful insights into the workings of the global financial system of the global economy, you will agree with me that it's really a privilege to have you here, Ben. And then we have uh, also a great acquaintance uh, of us because we had the honor of having uh, Carmen Reinhardt as a distinguished visiting fellow of our center, and uh, that is probably the top of your career, Carmen. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> uh, but Carmen, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible because she, she, very few people can say that they have had a distinguished career in academia, a distinguished career in an international organization, and now being very quickly becoming the face of one, if not the most prestigious economics think tank in the world, the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And Carmen has been there, I would say, just for a few months. And every time I look for Carmen, she's doing something, uh, of course, on behalf of herself, but also on behalf of the Institute. And we are so privileged to um, to have you here again, because the work you have done, uh, Carmen, uh, yourself, and uh, with your husband, and, uh, and uh, with Ken Rogoff, in the now famous uh, book of this time, is, is different. It's so powerful a contribution to understand the problem we are in, and I would say it's so relevant to derive some pertinent policy conclusions and therefore it's also great to have you here. So with that uh, in uh, introduction, why don't we ask uh, Carmen to make some opening remarks? What I would do is to ask our participants to give some 10 minutes of opening remarks. Then we may have some discussion among ourselves. Uh, and this is a house of debate, so we will not be shy for on any debate, and then we can have some interchange with our great audience. So Carmen, please. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to. Oops. Is it it's on. Yeah, it's, it's on. on. Okay. Yep. It's a pleasure to be back here. Um, I very much enjoyed my my visit here last year. Um, what I'd like to do in those ten minutes is put ver various themes on the table uh, that draw on my work on financial crises. Um, I'm going to start by saying I really. I don't envy the G20. Uh, I will start out by saying that it, if the G20 had the diagnosis correct in 2009, if they had the set of solutions in 2009, I would venture to say it would not have made a difference um, because the characteristic feature that we're going through in both sides of the Atlantic, it is more extreme in Europe right now, but I, to reiterate, it is on both sides of the Atlantic, in the U.S. as well, is a massive form of denial. Um, we, um, we have gone, let me just briefly start out, and this is some of the work that I've done with Ken Rogoff. Ken Rogoff and I recently wrote a paper called From Financial Crash to Debt Crisis. The basic point of that paper is that these processes start out with a lot of private borrowing, big surges in private debt, banks borrow, households borrow, debts get out of hand during that boom period in which debts are being piled up. Asset prices tend to do very well. In fact, they tend to boom. 
the economy does well, and everybody's a genius. However, during that boom period, bad loans are made, and ultimately the result is a financial crisis. That's stage one. We're past that. Okay. Now that's stage one financial crisis morphs into a fiscal crisis, which is where we're at. Revenues, as, as the financial crisis uh, deepens, recessions, and we've written about this with, with both Vincent, my husband, Vincent Reinhardt, and with Ken. Uh, we did a paper uh, for Jackson Hole last year, Vincent and I, called After the Fall, which basically makes the point, look, post-crisis decades are subpar in terms of growth, weaker growth, higher unemployment, weaker asset prices, okay? Uh, the recessions are deeper, longer lasting. No surprise that government finances deteriorate. Furthermore, the government takes on a lot of the debt that was previously private debt becomes public debt. This was true in the United States in the form of Fannie and Freddie. Fannie and Freddie, the two mortgage giants, were part of the financial sector debt, private financial sector. In 2010, they became part of the public sector debt. That added about 25 percentage points to the public debt in the US. Why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because what is next, OK, in this sequence? So the financial crisis morphed to a fiscal crisis. That's where we are. In, in, in Europe, we're having what we call debt with drama, in which solvency questions you know, abound. And this is not just for Greece. Uh, and in the U.S., uh, the, the crisis is more latent, but it is a fiscal crisis nonetheless in the making. Um, so I mentioned the word denial. In, in Europe, the denial has been of biblical proportions. I mean, you know, we've been calling a solvency crisis a liquidity crisis for two and a half years. And the turmoil that we are also seeing in this day uh, is in part a byproduct of that denial. So if you really recognize that you don't have a marginal problem, that, but that you have a really big, serious problem, perhaps you're more bold in the solutions. In Europe, the two and a half years since this process began, has been characterized by too little and too late. And this last delivery was part of that. Um, we got, finally, yes, we know we got a Greek haircut. Okay, great. But that, that's, that's effective ring fencing to contain the crisis, to prevent the kinds of things that have been happening in Europe in the last 24 hours, would have also meant being more proactive, meaning you really, put your best foot forward in recapitalizing the banks. You don't shortchange the banks so that the run doesn't spill from Greece to the European banks, which it has. And let us not forget that the restructurings will not end with Greece. If you look at the debts of uh, Ireland and you look at the debts of Portugal, uh, those debts do not appear to be sustainable by most reasonable economic assumptions, so I don't think the restructuring process will end with Greece. Italy's finances are complicated at this conjunction, even as we waver in this horrid market phase. I do think Italy and Spain will still sort of muddle through. I think everybody, the, the operative term here is muddle. I don't think this is the end of the world scenario, but in this sequence, in which you go from financial crash to a fiscal crisis. The next stage, I believe, will involve uh, a component, a big component of deglobalization in the financial industry. Governments are scrambling to place their debts, and who, who holds their debts? Captive domestic audiences, the pension funds, the insurance companies, the domestic banks. The emerging markets, which have been largely on the sidelines of this show, uh, are trying to be very leery of allowing too much hot money, seeking the eternal quest for higher yields. Uh, 
into uh, uh, coming across borders. So capital controls have flourished uh, with the large uh, blessing of the uh, IMF. What am I saying? Where are we in this drama? This drama is not over. I don't think the restructurings in Europe will end with Greece. I think the US uh, will see a protracted period of subpar economic activity. Not all crises manifest themselves in drama. Uh, but if you are looking for subpar associated with high levels of public and private debt, look no further than Japan. I am not saying the U.S. is Japan. It would be stretching the comparison. But I think the, the, the research that I've done uh, points in the direction of saying very high levels of public debt are associated with lower growth, and the process of private sector deleveraging is long and painful. Uh, and so the themes that I will leave with you, I will stop here. The themes that I will leave with you are the crisis is not over. The restructurings, there are more restructurings down the road. The period ahead is a, not necessarily, in my view, the end of the world or catastrophe or whatever, but it is a bleak period. Um, I think, at best, what we can hope is that the G20 helps foster a dialogue of recognizing the severity of the problem. There's a lot of denial. Uh, I was in a panel with Klaus Ringland. Uh, what's this, how you pronounce his name? Or did I slaughter it? It's pretty good. Okay, well, uh, in which my impression after listening to him in that panel was that there wasn't a, a European debt problem, there was a Greek debt problem. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, and I think, uh, looking forward, many of you uh, are interested in various dimensions of, of globalization. I think globalization, financial globalization, is going to be taking considerable steps backwards. And I let me leave that uh, uh, in that uplifting note. <laughs> let, me, let, let me stop there. Well, Ben, I don't want to ask you for the impossible, but uh, just let me say, can you say something more uh, optimistic than that? <laughs> but maybe it, it, it's not it, raining. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Snowy, snowy. <laughs> oh, okay. Sunny. <laughs> if you had held this uh, panel session last Friday, Ernesto, I would have been on, in the very unusual position of being the relative optimist on the panel. And uh, the reason I say that is when you're dealing with a delusional patient, getting the patient to acknowledge that he's suffering from delusions is a major step forward. And uh, the Eurozone leadership has been suffering from what I'd consider to be severe delusions for, all, for a long time. And big progress, I believe, was made at the end of last week on two fronts. One, acknowledging that Greece was not going to be able to pay its debts. Uh, that may seem obvious to all of you, perhaps obvious to, to us, but the Eurozone uh, leadership was unwilling uh, prior to last week to acknowledge that. And second, that um, uh, the Eurozone banks were going to have to be uh, recapitalized. Mm -hmm. The two problems go together intimately. The banks <coughs> in Europe are deeply exposed to uh, uh, sovereign debt. They are the main holders of sovereign debt in Europe. And of course, the sovereigns themselves are very exposed to the weaknesses in the banks because they've decided to underwrite all the banks' risks. You, you may remember several years ago when the uh, crisis hit in Ireland with the banks. It started as a banking crisis, not a, a, a government debt crisis. The first thing the Irish government did was say, don't worry, we guarantee all the, the uh, uh, debts of the six major Irish banks, uh, crisis is over. And of course, that simply uh, spread the crisis from the banks uh, to the government. So I thought the statement at the end of last week was at least a significant step forward. It was not a solution by any stretch of the imagination, but it was a, a formal recognition of the problem. And I think the fact that the markets reacted as, as well as they did at the end of last week was a, a, an indication that that was the general perception. Europe is coming to grips with, with the problem. Uh, today, everything is different.
Um, the uh, a statement by the Greek prime minister, which apparently shocked his own uh, uh, finance minister that he's going to hold a referendum in, in January uh, to decide whether to accept uh, this uh, bailout package is, to my mind, inconceivable. Uh, Greece right now is at the epicenter of uh, the Eurozone crisis and indeed a potential uh, world crisis, and it is not possible to run Greece like an ancient Greek city-state or a Swiss canton right now. Um, they have to say uh, yes, they have to say thank you, and they have to move on. Uh, in, in my view, there is no way, no way we get from here until January uh, uh, without a, a, a major crisis unless the, the, the Greeks back off on this. I don't know how politically one backs off on this, but it is not possible to get from here until January without a resolution of the Greek problem. Um, and that, of course, is just one, one of the fro many problems that we have to deal with. I believe in order for um, the Eurozone leadership to contain this uh, a crisis. They have to quarantine Greece, as it were, make sure that this problem doesn't spread beyond Greece. Uh, right now, in my view, the, the, the one institution that can hold the fort, as it were, and I'll explain what I mean by that momentarily, is the European Central Bank. And this is not the sort of institution that one would normally put forward as a, as a hero. Uh, it's an uh, unlikely hero. Um, it, it may be uh, shocking to, to you hearing a little bit of recent history now, but it was as recent as February of last year when Jean-Claude Trichet, who just stepped down as president of the ECB, said that it was, quote, unquote, inconceivable that Greece would go to the IMF. Not that Greece would default. That was, of course, inconceivable, but it was even inconceivable that they would go to the IMF. Then, of course, the ECB would never buy uh, European government debt. It would not engage in fiscal policy. It did that. Uh, then they told us, well, this has nothing to do with monetary policy. Don't worry. We will sterilize all these operations. In other words, the money that we, we print to buy the debt, we will soak back up through other means. They didn't do that. Um, so it's not a particularly credible institution right now. But politically, it's the only institution right now that can hold the fort by, uh, uh, in particular, uh, uh, financing the, the uh, 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 Italian deficits, buying uh, Italian government bonds at a considerably lower than uh, uh, market rate. Now, when I say they, ha they have to hold the fort, I want to emphasize that although many of you may r read commentary in the paper uh, that the, the ECB should spend uh, 1 trillion euros, 2 trillion, 3 trillion, whatever, whatever it takes to, to get us through this crisis, the ECB does not have unlimited ammunition. Um, the ECB has a total of 81 billion euros in capital. To put that in perspective, a 25% haircut on pig debt, that's Portugal, Ireland, Greece, I'm excluding Spain and Italy, would be enough to wipe out that 81 um, a billion euros in capital. Now, without getting into the technicalities of central banking, it is very possible for a central bank to operate for a period without capital. But the problem is that the markets are reasonably forward-looking, and someday the European Central Bank will have to tighten monetary policy, and the only way to do that is to have assets to sell. So they will have to be recapitalized. And so it all comes back to Germany, whether it's Germany uh, underwriting uh, uh, euro bonds, so-called uh, uh, euro bonds, or whether it's Germany underwriting the ECB. There is no escaping that at the end of the day, Germany will have to be willing and able uh, uh, to bear the bill here. And there are limits to what the, the German uh, uh, public are, are, are willing uh, to bear. Uh, I think the leadership is, is trying as cautiously as possible to explain to the German public that it's in their interest, uh, their own financial interest, long-term political interest of the country uh, uh, to, to step forward here and play the dominant role. But that's a difficult message to, to put forth, particularly given developments today. That is, the Greeks saying, we're not sure we like this deal. Um, we're going to ask our publics in January, and then we'll get back to you. Thank you very much. Um, that really, in my view, is, is wholly untenable. Now, many in Europe would like to believe that uh, China could represent a, a, a potential uh, component of the solution to this problem. Well, it, it's, it's clear why there's such enthusiasm for uh, China participating. 
Uh, if you look at China's net euro purchases last year, they are equivalent to the entire 2012 financing need of all the pigs nations, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Green and, uh, Greece, and Spain, all of them put together. So if China wanted to play a major role here, it certainly could. Uh, but I think we have a tendency in the United States and in Europe to view uh, the Chinese government as a completely monolithic entity that's completely uh, apart from public opinion in China because it's not a democracy. But the Chinese government has to be responsive to uh, uh, public opinion. Uh, uh, the stability of the, the government relies on that. And it would be extraordinarily difficult for the Chinese government to be able to explain to the people why they would be bailing out um, uh, rich Europeans when there's still uh, so much poverty and hardship within uh, uh, China. So politically, I do not see China as being um, uh, part of the solution. Um, it's difficult to talk much about the United States right now because But I would like uh, you <laughs> to talk about the United States. Maybe you can give us a good news there, but uh, I don't I'm know. I'm sure President, <laughs> <laughs> President Obama welcomes having some of the spotlight taken off him, at least for the moment, but it's going to be right back on in a few weeks' time. Uh, many of you may remember from the uh, a whole uh, a debt uh, crisis that captivated the world over the summer that there is a deficit super commission that is supposed to tell us by Thanksgiving uh, what the, the $1.5 trillion in uh, uh, debt reduction uh, is going to be comprised of. Um, and if they can't uh, uh, tell us that, then there's going to be an automatic chopping of $1.2 trillion from uh, discretionary spending. Uh, $500 billion of that will, will come out of uh, defense. I find it inconceivable that this commission of 12 angry men <coughs> and women with no Henry Fonda in the room to talk sense to them <laughs> could possibly come up with a solution this dramatic over the, the, the next three weeks. Um, that does mean that these automatic cuts are going to kick in, but I have little doubt that Congress will reverse them over the next several years. These, these are, uh, this is called discretionary spending because it's discretionary. Congress can, at its discretion, reinstate all of it uh, next year if they choose to do so. So I think the U.S. is going to be back in the, in the spotlight. Uh, Steve, you are my lo last hope, <laughs> but I, I am now <laughs> with very little hope. Well, I hate to let you down, Ernesto. <laughs> um, I, I'm very optimistic on China. Maybe I should stop there. But um, first of all, thank you for um, setting up this event in a rather timely uh, fashion, uh, brilliantly so, I, I might add. Um, and I give you credit for that. Um, I just want to pick up on something that, that Carmen uh, very eloquently said in, in her <clears throat> opening statement when she talked about denial of biblical proportions. The, the only um, area that I might differ with her on is that um, I would say that this denial is truly global in scope. Uh, the Europeans, you know, certainly have their strain of it, but it's something uh, deeply rooted uh, in, in our culture and was very much um, you know, part of the, uh, the blunders that were made uh, by Japan uh, in the late 80s and throughout uh, the 1990s. Somehow we just don't want to uh, admit when we've got it wrong. Uh, the, the record of the world in avoiding and dealing with crises over the last three decades is, is terrible. I, I'm looking at a list here of um, 11 crises in the past uh, 30 years, starting with the Latin debt crisis of the early 80s, stock market crash of 1987, U.S. S&L crisis 1990, Japan 1990, uh, Mexico, sorry, Ernesto, in uh, 1995. I'm an expert for the wrong reason. 
Asian financial crisis, 97, 98, LTCM in 98, dot-com bubble in 2000, accounting scandals in 2001, subprime in 2007 in Europe now. I mean, it's, you know, a crisis every three years. They get bigger, they get more global in scope, <clears throat> and we really don't have a much of a clue as to how to avoid them, let alone deal with them. G20, great idea, I agree with you. Uh, too bad it's not working. Uh, these G20 summits have become uh, more of an event planning exercise than something of substance in really, I think, grappling with the tough issues that um, uh, the world economy uh, needs to address. I just want to deal with three aspects of this uh, policy debate that I think um, need to be put on the table uh, in uh, trying to assess <coughs> where we're headed. Uh, number one, I think we're, um, and, and this is contentious, especially at Yale, when we, we had an internal summit with some of the great minds of Yale a few weeks ago in trying to solve the U.S. Um, uh, jobs problem. The consensus of that group was that uh, we had the right policies, we just didn't have enough of them. Uh, my take um, is that uh, that view is wrong, that uh, blunt stabilization policies just um, are not working to resuscitate uh, crisis-torn uh, economies. That's true of traditional Keynesian fiscal policies as well as these creative, unconventional monetary policies. It's not a question of degree. It's just a question of whether or not these policies are able to achieve traction in uh, ending balance sheet recessions. Um, Twenty plus years later in Japan, it's clear that th these policies don't work. And I would say a few years into our Japanese-like balance sheet recession uh, and its aftermath in the U.S., these policies aren't working as well. The second point I want to make is a corollary to this, and that is that it is increasingly evident uh, that targeted policies aimed at balance sheet repair uh, uh, stand a much better chance of working. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, the so-called congestion of corporate zombies, uh, the, um, the economic um, walking dead, um, started to, 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 to work pretty well uh, in Japan once the, the restructuring of Japanese companies uh, began in earnest in the late 1990s. Uh, and I think that's a, there's an important lesson there, especially for the United States, in as much as we now have a large generation of zombie consumers uh, that need um, uh, help in dealing uh, with the problems that critically ail their balance sheets. And I would say policies of debt forgiveness uh, and creative um, uh, saving incentives would go a long way in fixing uh, and accelerating the balance sheet repair uh, in the U.S. In Europe, you've, you've already talked about the zombies. They're mainly government officials and policymakers uh, who um, continue to duck the biggest elephant in the room that was underscored by the point already made uh, today very eloquently uh, by Ben, and that is that you know, Europe can talk about um, uh, the single currency, the single central bank, till they're blue in the face, but there's no fiscal or political union. <coughs> and until that leg gets put into the stool, uh, the stool is, 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 is very much in danger of uh, tipping over. And I guess the, the, the final point I want to just throw in, in, you know, inject into this discussion uh, Ernesto, is that these, this list of um, policies, increasingly global in scope, um, is, is, is critically uh, uh, important, especially in the context of that very provocative and depressing point that Carmen left us with, the, the risk of financial deglobalization. I, I really share that. Uh, and it's, it's a huge uh, uh, worry of mine. And it really demands that groups like the G20, uh, 
um, tr who are empowered politically uh, to, to deal with global issues, um, are, it's really incumbent upon them to think much more deeply uh, about a robust global policy architecture. Uh, and they talk the talk, and as Carmen said, they're not walking the walk, or I guess that was you, Ernesto. Um, you might have said it too, Carmen. But in, in what needs to be done there, they've, they've, they've talked about it in terms of multilateral surveillance, uh, developing early warning metrics, but they refuse to really tackle the toughest piece of that, which is an enforcement mechanism. What happens uh, if, company, uh, if countries violate these various um, uh, uh, rules uh, that, that jeopardize the global economy? Are there consequences of that? Uh, I think there must, needs to be much greater focus on the issue of financial stability. We pay lip service to that, but we don't do it. Um, the Chinese, there's a, you know, a, a, a model of economic management that we can, I think, take lessons from in their fixation on stability, uh, financial, economic, and social stability. Um, and finally, I think we continue to be in denial of uh, biblical proportions, to steal your word, of the, the perils of global imbalances, the fact that countries get away uh, forever with running uh, savings deficits, current account deficits, or, uh, or the, the same is true of, of, of the surpluses. And the, um, if you add up all the current account surpluses and deficits uh, in the world today, irrespective of sign, uh, they peaked out at about 6% of GDP, I think, uh, pre-crisis in 2006. Uh, which is about six times what they were uh, 10 years earlier. Uh, they're narrower now, but probably just temporarily because of business cycle uh, conditions. We are deluding ourselves into believing that we can live in a world with sustained global imbalances. So this is a, you know, um, I won't say it's the 11th hour, but, you know, the clock is ticking. And uh, the stakes are getting uh, bigger. And um, I think um, Monsieur Sarkozy was feeling really uh, very happy, uh, as Ben put it um, uh, late last week. He was going to go into this um, uh, the summit in Cannes with, with great momentum. Uh, and now I, I, I don't think he even wants to show up. Uh, at this summit, and the G20 is clueless uh, uh, once again. Well, thank you for cheating us up, um, and let's have uh, some uh, interchange, and let me take uh, on something that uh, Carmen said. She said, well, he, uh, she said something like that. Okay, granting that they had the right diagnosis, and they knew what the solutions were. Uh, I don't think that would have made uh, a big difference. That was your statement. And this, of course, is uh, derived uh, in a way uh, from your impressive um, historical statistic uh, analysis of uh, previous crises, as well as uh, your analytics of the, of the present situation. But let me just, uh, for the sake of uh, excitement, try to, to challenge uh, that uh, idea with a mental exercise. And uh, simply assume that uh, the key G20 countries had tried harder to do what they say they would do early on in the crisis. Of course, what they did early on in the crisis was relatively easy to do, uh, but there was a, a different stage that demanded uh, the adoption of policies that we knew were politically uh, very difficult to adopt, but they were necessary. And the question wha was whether they did all what was within their capacity to execute those policies, uh, domestic policies. 
And the second question is, what would have happened if they had delivered uh, the kind of international coordination and cooperation that uh, they depicted, I would say, for good reason, as indispensable uh, in order to minimize the cost of adjustment that we have to go through, rather than being trapped in this sort of prison of mercantilism in which we are today, in which uh, is the prisoner's dilemma, uh, and uh, that could have the best uh, possible outcome because they truly refuse to empower a third party to put on the table in a very transparent way what was the respective responsibility of each of the major economies to get out of this uh, mess. And instead, the US has moved in one direction. Uh, China continues to move in its own direction. We have uh, spoken about Europe. So, so my challenge, my very modest challenge, is uh, in the sense that things should not be as they are uh, today. Uh, haven't we learned from history? And I think we have learned from history, because there have been some episodes uh, even some of those that were mentioned by uh, Steve, that could have had much worse outcomes. And they didn't have those outcomes because we had learned something from history. And probably the crisis in 08, 09 will be today a depression if we hadn't extracted a few lessons from the traumatic episodes of the 1930s. So we did learn some things, uh, or we learned a lot, but somehow political systems have been unable to deliver the necessary policies. So that will be my uh, little uh, challenge. I don't think uh, uh, that uh, it is determined in a fatal, fatal way that things should be as they are today. I think we have to put a lot of responsibility and I will say almost blame on uh, political leaders about the situation we are now in. But I don't know if my colleagues want to have a reaction, Carmen. Well, I stick to my view. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, not surprised. It, 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 hear me. Uh, f I've been studying crisis for 20 years and I have tried to convince European leaders, uh, unsuccessfully, uh, that the European crisis bears indeed many resemblances to emerging market crises uh, from beginning to end. It is just happening in a different region of the world uh, that we had become unaccustomed to having such crises since the 1930s. So um, there is a very closed mind to learn. And part of the G20 group is uh, emerging markets that dare they say that this crisis is a lot like an emerging market crisis. Sure, they should dare say that. Uh, but will it be heated? I don't, uh, I, so, so I have no confidence that even if they were to diagnose it properly and make the proper suggestions. Um, two years ago, it seems absurd now, there was this great debate about, oh, Greece is not gonna get an IMF program. <laughs> you know, Greece at the IMF, God forbid. Now, it is also the case that we have conveniently forgotten that uh, advanced economies were the primary users of the IMF up until the early 1980s, that Britain had the UK had 11 IMF programs. Those things seem to be forgotten. So we either forget things about our own past or we pretend that the things that happened to you somehow happened to you because you're not like me. <coughs> I'm summarizing what I believe is a fundamental problem with human nature, which is why crises keep happening. And have, they, have we learned? We have learned in a limited way. I would put a capital letter on limited because the, the, the essence of this time is different, is that 
oh, those leverage ratios, we don't really have to worry about those leverage ratios because after all, we're dealing with new instruments. After all, we are advanced economies. Uh, after all, this time is different. Um, and when it comes to crisis resolution, it's the same. I mean, the, the, the very early on, I'm not saying this as a sort of, I, very early on, Ken Rogoff and I were out there saying in, in 2008, Debts are going to have to be restructured. That you know, restructuring was part of the answer. It wasn't uh, not a pretty answer, but it's part of the answer. Um, and uh, even very recently, um, there was complete denial on that. Um, and I, I just want to go to something Ben said on the denial issue. And I see things, Ben, is the same way as you do. This is ultimately the central banks are going to have to play a big role here. And whether we like it or not, a lot of the debt has, has to be monetized. A lot of this is, is just too big and onerous. However, the denial at, at which the ECB, at least in language, if not in actions, because they're buying Italian bonds as we speak, right, left, and center, uh, is is massive, and again, I think you know we're very Ernesto. I, I I think we learned some things to make sure that the crisis wasn't as bad as the 1930s. So it wasn't as deep as the 1930s, but it may very well be as long as the Japanese one, because we're not out of this woods yet. So I, I'm just very skeptical. Yeah, and Erne can I just pick up on that just for a second? Mm -hmm. um, I think you're correct to um, Ernesto to you know congratulate policymakers for being good at stopping a crisis, and and it's debatable as to whether or not that's a lesson from the '30s or from other episodes. But you know I'll grant that that's the case. So they've learned that when markets are uh, dysfunctional and free fall and sentiment is collapsing to marshal all the firepower they can, especially central banks, and flood the system with liquidity and stop the crisis. But stopping the crisis is one thing, and sustaining a recovery is another. And they haven't figured out how to do that, no matter what you say. Uh, and moreover, I would argue that because of the severity of this rolling three years of crisis, and it goes back further than that, uh, we've now got policy instruments locked down into uh, zones with zero interest rates and double-digit budget deficits that they can't get out of. Every time, I mean, you know, again, study Japan. You know, every time they try to move out of zero <coughs> interest rates, you know, the system rolls over again. Um, and then we have this debate over austerity uh, on uh, fiscal policy. And I would argue that this policy conundrum we're in, uh, leaving our key monitoring fiscal instruments um, at extreme levels by any standard of the imagination, sets us up for more uh, of the same. Uh, nobody can predict with great precision um, the next crisis, although Carmen, to her credit, laid out a very provocative, um, I guess, stage three. Uh, but um, I, I think we're just asking for trouble until we crack uh, the, the code of, um, uh, of moving out of the crisis response uh, mindset into uh, trying to figure out how in God's name we can ever foster a sustainable post-crisis recovery. That's an enormous challenge right now. But, but there were two ideas. Uh, one was a balance sheet uh, repair. And the other is uh, addressing seriously, uh, systemically, structurally, the problem of global imbalances. And uh, if I go back to many statements that have been made, I would say there is no lack of awareness from the part of policymakers that uh, these kind of issues must be addressed. And then the question is why they don't do it. I mean, it's not because they are silly. 
But there must be something about uh, political systems, a capacity to, to trigger or to use the right instruments to address these kind of, uh, of problems. And that, I think, somehow takes us back to the, uh, the core of our profession. You know, when was it that we forgot that economics was about human beings and solving real life uh, issues? That our classics used to call our discipline political economy. And therefore, we were supposed to understand not only economic models, but also to understand uh, politics. And therefore, my, my question provocative to Ben, I mean, do you see political systems to evolve into? I think you're, you're Ernesto, you're almost being too kind to the political leadership in, in Europe and the United <laughs> States by suggesting that it's just a, a matter of systemic incapacity. Uh, let me take up your invitation earlier to refer to um, uh, uh, economic history, to, to give an example. In the 1940s, the United States was absolutely dominant in the global uh, 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 economy. In terms of our net creditor position, we were um, uh, beyond where China is uh, uh, right now. Um, what position did we take in the first half of the 1940s with regard to global imbalances? American foreign economic policy was uh, run at that time by a, a, a narrow-minded, bullheaded individual named Harry Dexter White, who was convinced that this was a great opportunity for the United States to change the world by forcing liquidation of the British Empire and building up a new alliance with the Soviet Union. He was, it turned out, a part-time Soviet agent. Um, and he was absolutely determined at Bretton Woods to make sure that other countries could not have any impact on the United States net creditor pos position. He was determined that the United States would be able to uh, 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 maintain it. And what happened uh, right after the war? Britain collapsed. It caused, caused a political calamity for the United States. Dean Acheson, who uh, eventually became Secretary of State, said, my God, while he watched Greece collapse. Greece was collapsing because the, the uh, British were pulling out all their troops because they couldn't afford to pay them anymore. He said, my God, there are only two powers left in the world, the United States and the Soviet Union. We have to do something now. And the United States changed policy entirely. Um, uh, instead of foreign economic policy being driven by Harry Dexter White, it was now driven by uh, General Marshall, who became Secretary of State. And uh, his economic brain, a man named Will Clayton, who I have enormous admiration mm -hmm. for, who, who remade uh, American foreign economic policy. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the, the first things they did in order to rectify the, the, the collapse in, in Europe was the Marshall Plan, which is something Harry Dexter White could never have conceived of. But it made an enormous difference. There was a vast dollar shortage. Um, uh, in Europe, which was collapsing the entire uh, uh, global economy. And the United States took a, a, a far-sighted uh, approach at the time. They would not let that happen. They would help Europe rebuild. They would force European integration. In fact, in many ways, it was the United States um, uh, that built the foundations of the, the, the European Union. So political leadership actually does matter. Individuals in power can have enormous influence. It's not just, well, the system won't let us. The, the actual people in power do make a difference. Uh, people like Sarkozy and Merkel and Papandreou, they could make uh, uh, an enormous difference. They could do things uh, differently.